an impossible problem? I, I think that that title was already criticized, but we're going to keep it for a little while. We have three panelists today. They're all going to speak for 15 minutes each. We also have one discussant after they are done. I'm going to introduce them individually. Our first panelist is Mr. Dan Suryak. Mr. Suryak has written extensively on international trade and finance, innovation and industrial policy, and economic development, with particular focus on the digital transformation and the economic and technological roots of great power conflicts. Thank you very much, and um, it's a great pleasure to be here. Um, I lived uh, in Ottawa for the longest time, and this uh, uh, Montpellier, or Montpellier, as you say, call it here, um, is only four hours away, and I don't know how come I never visited, but I'm, I'm very, very pleased to be here for this conference. And um, yeah, as um, was mentioned, uh, I, I had a long career with the government of Canada as a trade economist, and you wonder, what is a trade economist doing at a conference on international relations? Um, and so I shall uh, do start with a bow to, 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 to that discipline by, by paraphrasing Clausewitz uh, and saying that um, uh, war is, seen through an economic lens, is an extension of economic rivalry. And that then uh, tees up nicely the uh, topic that I've been tasked uh, with uh, discussing, which is the implications of U.S.-China economic rivalry for peace in the Middle East. So just very, very briefly, um, China and the United States are on opposite sides of the world, and from an economic point of view, they are neither natural enemies nor natural uh, 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 partners. Uh, and for most of, their of the US history, it was really a minor part of, of the picture for the United States. Modern history starts with Deng Xiaoping's visit to the United States in, um, to, to Washington in 1979, which then sets up uh, China's opening up and China then launches into its era of industrialization. When it opened up to the world, the, uh, the, the nascent industrial structure that China had was basically, um, it, uh, became uh, defunct. It was not operational and not effective for the in integrated uh, global uh, uh, system of trade and production. And so it was de industrializing de novo. At the same time, and for completely un uh, different reasons, the United States um, was entering a new era. Um, it was on its heels to some extent because of the challenge from uh, Japan, the Red Sun Rising era, and, uh, and it was doubling down on innovation as its strength. So this was the Beidou Act of uh, 1980 passed by the Carter administration. And then fortuitously, IBM released its personal computer in 1981, and 1981, 82, there was a, a computer aided design, a CAD CAM software was released for the, per, for the personal computer, putting powerful industrial design tools on every desk in America's universities with the uh, impetus given to um, uh, the universities to commercialize their, uh, their, their knowledge development uh, through the Beidou Act. And in retrospect, as we look back, this launched the United States onto um, a magnificent run. Um, they disposed of the, uh, you disposed of the Japanese challenge like that, um, defeated the uh, Soviet Union in the uh, Cold War, saw a, a, a magnificent technological rise that, sent, that, that made the NASDAQ a, a household name, rising to the unipolar moment. You enrolled your former rivals, uh, the Soviet Union and China into the system that you had created, which is the WTO-led uh, rules-based order, and you were there on top of the world, okay? In this period, what was happening? America's patenting was soaring, uh, and you were developing a knowledge-based economy, and you were naturally placed to profit or, or to capitalize on this economy because of the system of universities which you had across the country. And this was broad, uh, broadly spread prosperity for the United States. It did shift prosperity from the industrial uh, uh, centers like Cleveland and, uh, and other places to the university towns. So there was an internal strife, but America rode that moment. And China, of course, had 30 years of developing its industrial skills. So both economies uh, uh, 
benefited immensely from this essentially symbiotic uh, relationship, and there was no conflict. In the final year of his administration, George Bush delivers a um, uh, State of the Union address. He mentions China only once, in the same breath with India, as a large emerging market that's going to be important for to deal with, with, with issues like climate change. So then what happens? Uh, and and then there are other issues which I, I think my fellow panelists will, will, like, will comment on. But we then have the Obama pivot to Asia. And that pivot to Asia takes uh, two specific forms. One is the uh, launch of the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which was explicitly couched as a, a means, uh, as a contest between who is going to write the rules of the road in the Asia Pacific, China or the United States. The second component was the air sea battle doctrine, uh, which is basically uh, formulated, and, and you guys know much more better than this, but it was formulated to counter the fact that, that, that China was developing a modern navy at great speed. So this now China and the United States are, 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 are on a, now on a course that from enemy to at least frenemy. Okay? Now what's happening in the economy? In the late 2000s, there are several new technological developments which are going to launch a new kind of economy. One of them was the development of neural nets by uh, 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 Jeffrey Hinton at the University of Toronto in 2006. One of them was the development uh, or the application of GPUs to neural nets by Stanley Ng and his team at Stanford in 2009. And then the critical one was the release of the iPhone by Apple in 2007. The iPhone then launched the mobile age, and the mobile age said enormous amounts of data flowing into the cloud. Neural nets drive off data, and so the combination of these three uh, developments enabled a new kind of economy, the data-driven economy. And it also opened up a whole new kind of sphere of social media. While Facebook had been around since 2004, many of the major uh, uh, social media uh, uh, companies were formed in 2010, coming out of the great financial crisis. And where data is the new oil for the economy, for, so, for society and for politics, it's been called the new plutonium. It's very destructive and, very, uh, and, and can be very damaging. So just kind of hold that thought in mind. So now we're in, moving into this new economy. At the same time as the, as the US is now trying to exploit its new technological developments, and, and it is doing so with uh, uh, companies like Google and Facebook dominating the globe, uh, operating at, at a global level. I mean, at one point, Facebook had more clients than the populations of the United States, China, and the European Union put together. That's the scale of, of these companies. Um, as, so as the United States is, with, is exploiting its first move of advantage, China is actually moving into the knowledge-based economy 30 years behind the United States. But it is uh, starting its patenting activity it's training legions of patent examiners. It uh, uh, establishes new uh, specific intellectual property uh, courts. And it starts litigating internally ferociously. It's learning the patent game. And one factor that was driving this was the fact that one of the first things Obama did was to actually launch a Section 301 investigation of China. And there's a couple, two massive reports were, were released which showed that if China observed as the same prop IP laws as the United States, it would mean a very significant benefit to the United States. I've written on this, and I've put figures on the order of 500 to uh, billion to 900 billion dollars for the value of, of U.S. IP. We're talking serious money. Okay, so China is 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 adapting and is now moving into the knowledge-based economy and doing so very very successfully. But as I said, at a 30-year gap. Its international uh, economic receipts, even in 2021, are a fraction of what the U.S. has. About six billion, the U.S. has got about 128 billion, to give you a sense of the gap. But it has moved into the game, and in 2021, China passed the United States as the largest buyer of technology. Okay, so people talk about China stealing. They were actually buying the technology now in great amounts. That's what's happening in the KBE or the knowledge-based economy. At the same time, China is also moving into the data-driven economy. It had been perfecting its system of, uh, of censorship and whatnot for, for the internet behind the Golden Shield project, the so-called Great Firewall. 
And it was developing companies behind that firewall that would then become giants, paralleling uh, the Microsofts and the, um, oh, sorry, the, uh, the, the, uh, the Googles and the Facebooks in China, uh, Alibaba and Tencent, for example. And because of, again, a curious coincidence that there was a, a strife between, uh, in a room sheet between the Uyghurs and Han Chinese, they shut down Facebook and Google in China to control the information flow. And very shortly thereafter, they basically booted Google out of China completely. So they then developed their entire ecosystem of data-driven firms behind the Great Firewall, and they were in direct competition now with the United States for, to capture the value of this economy. By 2018, the combination of China's technological uh, sort of developments had allowed Huawei to steal a march on uh, the other companies working in 5G. China was now the world leader in 5G technology. That was the Sputnik moment for the United States. And that's when the United States went into overdrive in the technological war to slow down China and actually to, to, to catch up in, in 5G. So that meant that China was now moving from frenemy to now actually a, a, a significant technological rivalry. There are a lot of other things that happened around that time under the Trump administration that make absolutely no sense to a trade economist, certainly. The, the trade war that was launched on China with tariffs uh, was damaging to the United States and did not damage China in particular. Uh, it was just bad for the world. And then there was the, the, the atmospherics with the you know, China virus, the uh, China steals, China cheats, et cetera, et cetera, simply put the two countries into a rhetorical contest that spiraled down. Um, so that's what's happening with China and the US. In the industrial sphere, they're cooperative. In the knowledge space sphere, uh, China is joining the US. In the data sphere, China and the US are rivals. Okay? What does this mean for the Middle East? So we go to the Middle East and we, and we talk about, again, the uh, uh, strife comes out of the basic economics of the situation. In the 1970s, as, as was, has already been mentioned, uh, there were two major uh, oil price shocks. The US was a net importer of oil, and it moved into the Middle East to a secure supply. Okay, oil dro put, drove the United States into the Middle East. China was not there at hardly at all at, through the, uh, the entire period of, of, of uh, the last two, two centuries, with a possible exception, I don't know too much about this, uh, during the Mao years of exporting ideology. Uh, you guys know, know, know that better than I do. But basically, China was not in the Middle East. The US went in big time and in competition with the Soviet Union to ensure that it could control its supply of oil and not be held hostage as it was during the oil price shocks. So now we fast forward to uh, the current period. The United States is no longer a net importer. It is a net exporter of oil and gas. The fracking revolution had meant that its reserves on both accounts are at all-time highs. Uh, it is no longer dependent on Middle East oil in that same fashion. China is now dependent upon Middle East oil. And of course, it's also got Russia, which is being blocked from the European market. So China has actually got lots of oil to deal with. And the Americans have got their own. So oil has ceased to be a major issue for the United States in the Middle East. And the logic says that the US will lose interest in the Middle East for that reason. Not entirely and not immediately, but certainly it will be in a, in a phase of withdrawal. Meanwhile, the US containment of China, which was extraordinarily beneficial for China, just to give you a, a figure to uh, carry around in your mind, China became a 75, million, 75 trillion net worth economy under containment from the United States. Its foreign policy elites might have hated it, but it was the best thing possible. China could not do anything stupid on the international stage because of that containment, which is very, very effective. Now, China, however, wanted to break out from that, and its method of breaking out was the Belt and Road Initiative, and that took it to places where it, it could go. Um, it, it, it could not go into, into the United States. It had. Uh, uh, trouble in Western Europe, which, were, uh, which was allied with the United States, but it could get into Eastern Europe. It certainly got into the Middle East and it got into Africa. So the Chinese breakout strategy brought it to the Middle East in what fashion? Building infrastructure, which then used up its uh, uh, excess capacity that it had developed to build its own cities and its own infrastructure in the 2000s, and, and to spend some of the money that they had accumulated in foreign exchange reserves. 
And so China is moving into the Middle East in what fashion? Not looking, it's partly about oil, but it's largely now about industrializing the Middle East. What does the Middle East want? As uh, Ambassador Al uh, Otaibi said this morning, he says they're trying to diversify away from oil as much as they can. They're looking to develop green energy sources. Saudi Arabia okay, is looking to build green energy. They would probably love to export uh, hydrogen to Europe and probably electricity, and they've got lots and lots of sun power. And who provides the solar panels? China. There's a natural partnership there, which is, uh, on that score, a very hopeful uh, uh, point for the Middle East. As the, uh, the Middle East suffered from the natural resource curse, which basically says if you've got a natural resource that people fight over, that will lead to internal strife and divisiveness and external interference. And that's exactly what happened. As that natural resource curse is lifted in the twilight of the oil age, the Middle East may be left to its own devices to actually sort out the various political problems that we've heard about so much. And to close up, uh, then the, the major fighting point of the modern economy, data, the Middle East doesn't have. It's a small population economy. Only the Gulf states and Israel are actually in that game. So no one's going to go fight in the Middle East over its data. So I'm hopeful on both scores. And I will wrap this up by uh, um, basically saying that in terms of the hegemon games, maybe the Middle East has seen its fill. I don't think there will, that there will be a Pax Sinica per se, but it, and if it does, it will come with some unsavory elements. But basically, the industrial economy is a cooperative one. It's not one that's divisive, so I'll leave it there. Thank you, Mr. Syriac. If you have questions, please try to jot them down or hold on to them. So when, at the conclusion of all of our presenters, you'll have an opportunity to come down to the microphones and ask any questions that you have. Our next presenter is Dr. Richard Morris, an associate professor in the Russian Maritime Studies Institute at the US Naval War College's Center for Naval Warfare Studies. His current research projects focus on the maritime dimension of Russia's Syria intervention, and he also specializes in US-Soviet relationships during the Cold War. Cold War sorry. First, uh, thank you to Yang Mo for inviting me and organizing a wonderful, wonderful conference. Uh, it's a tough act following uh, Dan Syriac over there, um, who, but uh, you did provide a good introduction with the Belt and Road Initiative uh, with what China has been doing in the Middle East, specifically since 2013. But if you take a, uh, if you wind the clock back to 2004, analysts at Booz Allen, Hamilton, uh, working for the Defense Department, did a study on global energy futures, and they saw what China was doing even before they announced the Belt and Road Initiative, and they called it something uh, called a string of pearls, that uh, they believed that China was establishing uh, ports and facilities primarily for economic purposes, but also to make En-ROADs that could then be used for naval bases, logistics support facilities, and intelligence collection uh, facilities as well. So uh, we've seen some elements of that develop in, in different places across the Indian Ocean and whatnot for China. Um, but looking forward uh, after 2015, Russia, as a result of its intervention in the Syrian civil war, uh, has pursued a similar strategy and they've actually been somewhat more overt about uh, trying to set up what they call material logistics points um, or logistics centers. Um, the only one they have right now is in Syria. Um, it's important to kind of contextualize this. Uh, Syrian ties with Russia date back decades. In the wake of the Second World War, uh, the Soviet Union, Russia's forebear, um, helped the Syrians establish their military after they uh, broke away from being a, a French protectorate. Um, they've had relations with the Assad family, Hafez al-Assad, the father of the current uh, autocrat, uh, Bashar al-Assad, uh, they had close ties with him in the 1960s and 1970s and actually started their presence there. Um, ties expanded, especially after Egypt kicked the Soviet Union out of its bases in, uh, on the Red Sea. And uh, it was kind of a heyday in the 1980s 
of U.S.-Russian relations or U.S.-Soviet relations in this, in this time period. So 1991 changed everything. Uh, with the dissolution of the Soviet Union, uh, Syria kind of went on the back burner. And the Soviet Union, which had uh, material logistics points or PMTOs, uh, not just in Syria and having had them in Egypt, but they actually had them on the Red Sea and what was then Ethiopia. Uh, they also had them in Qamran Bay uh, from 1979 to 2002. Um, these support facilities, they went by the wayside. Um, the Qamran Bay facility, like I said, closed in 2002. Uh, the Syrian facility stayed open, but there was very little activity that was going on after the dissolution of the Soviet Union until uh, really the Syrian uh, civil war started. After a group of teenagers wrote uh, anti-regime graffiti on the wall of their school in Dara, a city in southern Syria, and uh, they were arrested, and then um, unwisely the uh, police tortured them and then released them. So it got kind of widespread uh, notice at the time and, and resulted in nationwide protests and the Assad regime clamped down. In that period, Russia actually was kind of keeping everything at arm's length. Russia was very clear that it was going to uh, continue to honor contracts for weapons deliveries. It was a, the primary uh, supplier of weapons to Syria. And, it wasn't going to get more involved than that. So fast forward another few years, the Syrian conflict is, has gotten very bad by uh, 2013 for the Assad regime. Uh, the regime had lost most of, uh, control of most of, its, uh, most of its territories to different groups, uh, uh, Syrian Democratic Forces, um, also the rise of ISIS, which we talked about uh, in earlier panels. Um, and they come streaming across the desert in uh, 2013 and 2014 to take large parts of Syria and Iraq. So the Assad regime is kind of on the ropes and starts to use chemical weapons. And the uh, Obama administration uh, is, uh, draws a red line, which it then uh, kind of ignores as the uh, Syrians continue to use and expand their use of chemical weapons until an attack in, in 2013, in, in late 2013, uh, in Damascus, in the eastern suburbs of the city, in which uh, anywhere from, we don't know the exact numbers, but anywhere from 500 to several thousand uh, people died in the attacks, and the Assad regime used nerve agent. So the Obama administration comes out and says it's going to uh, punish Assad, and is poised to strike, and uh, in comes Vladimir Putin to uh, various diplomatic channels with Secretary of State Kerry at the time to kind of save Assad in exchange for, uh, to avoid a U.S. strike or allied strike because the French and the British were kind of on board. Uh, the British actually backed down. But the Assad regime, uh, the, sorry, the Putin uh, government made it a, a deal with the U.S. to kind of uh, avoid a U.S. strike on Syria in exchange for Syria giving up its, its chemical weapons. That's 2013. Uh, Russia tends to honor this agreement and the chemical weapons were removed. There have been additional chemical weapons attacks in, in Syria and we saw US retaliatory strikes for this, but they were nowhere near the scale of what happened in, in 2013 and they weren't with sophisticated nerve agents. But um, Russia doesn't intervene for two years after this. It's 2015 before they intervene. And they intervene in 2015 because the Assad regime was kind of again on the ropes. They had gained back some, uh, some areas, but were still uh, lacking control of uh, one of the most populous cities, the uh, oldest uh, continuously inhabited place, uh, Aleppo, in, in northern Syria. And the story is that the Iranians actually approached the Russians to try to have the Syrians ask for Russian assistance in, in fighting this, asking for intervention. So Russia comes in kind of as a uh, white knight and uh, agrees that they're going to conduct a campaign against the armed groups that are illegal in Russia, such as ISIS or um, really just any Syrian opposition group. And that is what they do. Um, you can judge the, the motivations uh, in different ways. Uh, ostensibly, Russia went into Syria to fight terrorists and to support the legitimate, what they view as the legitimate government of Bashar al-Assad. Um, 
reality uh, is probably very different. Um, it was a place for them to test weapons. It was a, a place for them to gain influence. It was also a way for Russia to increase its foothold in the Eastern Mediterranean within firing range of the Suez Canal, the, the northern entrance and exit, and kind of reestablish what had been missing since Soviet times. So the Russian Federation introduced a maritime doctrine in 2015. There was no mention of Syria. There was no mention of material logistics points. Um, but as a result of what is viewed in Moscow as a successful intervention on behalf of the Assad regime, uh, the maritime doctrine was revised and expanded in just in 2022, in July. And it is very explicit about uh, maintaining that presence in Syria and the Eastern Mediterranean, and not just that, but actually expanding it, trying to establish additional material logistics points in places like the Red Sea and the Indian Ocean. Um, uh, Dahuk is no longer in Ethiopia, it's now Eritrea, but there's, uh, there have been press reports about uh, Sergei Lavrov, the Russian foreign minister, visiting Eritrea to try to set it up. There was an agreement that was actually signed and ratified by the Russian Duma or parliament um, with Sudan to establish a PMTO. Um, the Sudanese have actually not ratified it yet. They're under a military government right now. and. Um, the military has said they approve of the document, but it needs to be ratified by a civilian legislature, which doesn't actually exist yet um, because of Sudanese problems uh, internally. But Russia does have its sight on strategic locations, the Red Sea, Horn of Africa, um, also all the way across into the Indian Ocean, uh, South Asia, etc. It's aspirational at this moment, but it is indicative that of the way that Russia views its intervention in Syria and its kind of role in trying to establish a multipolar world system. Uh, Vladimir Putin has been very explicit about trying to establish multi multipolarity and uh, saying that hegemony, the US dominated world order is not, is not uh, appropriate for the world and uh, has been kind of a champion of that. But alas, with Russia's disastrous war in Ukraine, uh, the means and the ability for Russia to actually um, expand these material logistics points is, is somewhat questionable. And looking at traffic flows of uh, military cargoes from the Black Sea, uh, the Syrian Express, um, through the Mediterranean to the port of Tardis, you see that there was a peak really in 2016-2017. Uh, and it has been kind of on the decline since then. Uh, with the Turks closing the Turkish Straits, um, it, last year, as a result of Russia's attack on Ukraine, uh, there are no more, uh, no more uh, visible military traffic uh, shifts, and it's uh, primarily gone to, pardon me, it's primarily gone to commercial carriers, which we saw that shift kind of begin a few years ago when Russia started its intervention, it used everything, including timber carriers. Uh, for Arctic timber carriers were used to transport military cargoes. Again, Russia has these aspirations. The means are, are somewhat questionable, but it does suggest that maybe there is a, a Russian string of pearls out of the Syrian Express. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Moss. Our next and final presenter is Dr. Nicholas Roberts, a historian of the modern Middle East and Islamic world. He's an assistant professor of history at Norwich University. And for the academic year of 22-23, the inaugural W. Nathaniel Howell postdoctoral fellow in Arabian Peninsula and Gulf Studies at the University of Virginia. So thank you to everyone for being here, especially all my students in the room. I fully expect each of you to be down here ready to roast me as soon as I finish. <laughs> and happy Nowruz to uh, everyone in the room celebrating. Uh, I'm going to begin, as historians often do, with an anecdote. A few months ago, my landlord was at my house. We were in a room where I keep all of my books. He was looking through all of them, and he said, geez, you must really like reading about the Middle East. I shrugged and said, you could say it's something of a pastime. 
Then he got very serious and he looked at me and he said, you know, they've been fighting each other over there forever. You know, they're Sunni and Shia. It's all tribal over there. He seemed puzzled when I responded, wow, how very European of them. My landlord's comment was unsurprising. I've heard it a thousand times. His comment reveals a distinctly American ontology, a structure of knowledge about the United States and the rest of the world. And that comment, no matter how seemingly benign, is one small manifestation of empire. Throughout the United States, uh, throughout the 19th century, the United States emerged as a new form of empire on the world stage. Many scholars have shown how intervening in the broader Middle East has become fundamental in implicit and explicit ways to everyday American life. Part of this includes a pernicious history of countless academic forums, just like this one, questioning whether peace will ever be possible in the Middle East, and if so, how that peace might be brought about with the United States as the analytical point of departure. There are many reasons offered for why peace might be impossible. They typically include the ostensible lack of a European-style reformation, age-old religious feuds, separate lack of separation of religion and politics, sectarianism, tribalism, or inherent inclinations toward violence. Each of those is historically illiterate, and I'd be happy to bust all those myths in the discussion period. But what the American reflex for debating peace in the Middle East usually fails to account for is that, by all accounts, the US, US government and military actions in the Middle East to include the actions of local rulers supported, financed, and armed by the United States have been the most significant causes of death and destruction in that region's post-World War II history. In my paper, I argue, or suggest really, that the United States has manifest a particular form of power that allows it to attempt, however successfully, to act by means of absolving itself of its own history, creating, fortifying, and sustaining that which it later tries to expunge. Historian Arif Dirlik once said that to define as to name is to conquer. I would take that a step further and suggest that one way American empire has manifest is not just by defining, but by defining a present by means of eliding entire histories, beginning with human beings. We can begin by going back in time then to Baghdad, Iraq in 1979, when Saddam Hussein seized power. His seizure of power would have neither surprised nor worried American or allied officials. In fact, he had been an American asset already for decades. Recall that as Saddam seized power, Iran was undergoing its own revolution, itself the direct result of an American coup aimed at ridding Iran of its democracy. Saddam immediately set about planning an invasion of Iran, and American support for that war was neither tacit nor entirely covert. In what is now known as the Green Light Memo, then Secretary of State Alexander Haig wrote in 1980 to US President Ronald Reagan that the year prior, President Carter gave the Iraqis a green light to launch the war against Iran. The Iran-Iraq war came at an astonishing human cost. There were millions of casualties, especially from Saddam's almost daily use of chemical and biological weapons. The US was aware of the use of those weapons, but it was also aware of more. In November 1983, the State Department admitted that the Iraqi government had purchased the infrastructure for their chemical weapons program primarily from Western firms, including possibly a US foreign subsidiary. The full scale of American support for Saddam's war in Iran came to light in the 1990s, including several court cases which are now mostly declassified and public. A 1994 investigation by the US Senate revealed dozens of biological agents shipped to Iraq, including anthrax and insecticides, with the crop spraying helicopters for dispensing those insecticides. In December 1988, for one example, Dow Chemical sold one and a half million dollars worth of pesticides to Iraq. A US Export-Import Bank official reported in a memorandum that he could find, quote, no reason to stop the sale. At the center of American policy was Donald Rumsfeld. After several meetings with the Iraqis, the United States began supplying Iraq with more weapons, more technologies, and more money. 
but also publicly condemned Iraq and Saddam for the use of chemical weapons. That was a public statement that surprised the Iraqis. The Iraqis were so caught off guard by the public condemnation because the weapons they were using had come from the Americans and their Western allies. To be sure, Saddam's blunders in the war devastated his country, a situation he made far worse when he invaded Kuwait in 1990. In that war, the American military trounced Saddam's forces. International sanctions squeezed the life out of Iraq. No-fly zones monitored the country. And thousands of international weapons inspectors confirmed that. Though Saddam wanted his neighbors to believe he was still powerful, there were no more weapons programs and barely even a military at all. The Iraqi people could live nothing but the most meager standard of life. In September 1995, the United Nations World Food Program announced that more than 4 million Iraqi civilians, a fifth of Iraq's population, was dying of malnutrition because of the sanctions. That number included 2.5 million children and 600,000 pregnant or nursing mothers. The report warned in a hauntingly prescient statement, quote, 70% of the population has little or no access to food. The social fabric of the nation is disintegrating. People have exhausted their ability to cope. Beginning almost immediately after 9-11, the Bush administration began planning a war with Iraq. The US military's most senior commanders were caught off guard. Some voiced their opposition to the detriment of their careers. According to the eminent journalist Mark Perry, in November 2001, after a White House meeting discussing the war in Afghanistan, President Bush pulled aside Donald Rumsfeld, once again at the helm of American policy, and ordered him to begin preparing war plans for an invasion of Iraq and, quote, to get Tommy Franks looking at what it would take to protect America by removing Saddam Hussein, end quote. As Perry described, Rumsfeld sent orders to General Franks at his CENTCOM headquarters, <clears throat> where Air Force then Major General Victor Renouart received them. Their responses to those orders are on the slide in front of you. Nevertheless, and despite these objections, the war played on. Upwards of half a million Iraqi civilians died from direct US military actions in Iraq. The war took an already devastated Iraq and buried it. The paradox of the war was not just a scholarly abstraction. And I will add here that it's something the United States Army concluded in its official two-volume, several thousand page long self-study of the war in Iraq. Operation Iraqi Freedom was begun by means of shock and awe. One American official in Baghdad described the strategy as such, quote, the only way we can win is to go unconventional. Terrorism versus terrorism. As we've got to scare the Iraqis into submission, he said. Most of Iraq's infrastructure was destroyed, and as civilian deaths mounted in November 2003, Donald Rumsfeld, Secretary of Defense, was asked if he had an idea how many civilians had died. He responded, we don't do body counts on other people. Rumsfeld's statement reveals a broader historical phenomenon of the United States in the Middle East in which it has sought to create a unidirectional narrative that elides the voices, the lives, and the histories of the subjects of its empire. His statement reveals the American imperial reflex of absolving itself of its own history, divorced from the functions of the present. It illuminates how the United States has the power to act as if the rest of the world, its peoples and their histories, are somehow separate from itself. It is an imperial world in which the United States can act and can impose, but cannot be held responsible. I'll end here then on a part of this interconnected history that I'm certain will be unknown to most of those in the room. We'll turn to Afghanistan and the idea of militant jihad. Osama bin Laden graduated college in 1979 and went directly to Afghanistan. He was part of a wide movement of Arabs going there to fight alongside the Afghanis in expelling the Soviets, who had invaded that same year. Only two days after the invasion, National Security Advisor Zbigniew Brzezinski wrote a memo to President Carter. He noted that Muslim countries would, quote, be concerned with the invasion noting also that it was something, quote, we might be in a position to exploit. He continued to add, we should concert with Islamic countries both in a propaganda campaign and in a covert action campaign to help the rebels. 
The covert action campaign, Operation Cyclone, is now well known, but the propaganda campaign is only recently being unearthed. By 1987, the, U the United States was annually sending through Pakistan $630 million to the Mujahideen, Arabs and Afghans fighting the Soviets. This money was used to train, pay, and arm nearly 20,000 Mujahideen fighters every year. But as Brzezinski called for, the US supplied them with more than guns and money. Beginning in 1986, the US government teamed with the University of Nebraska at Omaha to create the, quote, education program for Afghanistan. This program created and printed millions of textbooks that were disseminated throughout Afghanistan and Pakistan from a headquarters they built in Peshawar. These textbooks were for ages K through 12. They magnified an understanding of jihad as a violent, mandated, individual, and collective duty for fighting non-Muslims, namely the Soviets. With titles such as the Alphabet of Jihad Literacy, these textbooks were part of an American strategy of indoctrinating young Muslims in the region to fight at any cost against the Soviets. In a first grade language arts textbook, for example, the entry for the equivalent letter D taught, Del is for Deen, or religion. Our religion is Islam. The Russians are the enemies of Islam. It also taught, Zel is for Dom, or oppression. Oppression is forbidden. The Russians are oppressors. We perform jihad against the oppressors. In another textbook, the entry for the equivalent letter K taught, Kabul is the capital of our dear country. No one can invade our country. Only Muslim Afghans can rule over our country. A fourth grade mathematics textbook taught the following problem, quote, the speed of a Kalashnikov bullet travels at 800 meters per second. If a Russian is at a distance of 3,200 meters from the Mujahid, and the Mujahid aims at the Russian's head, calculate how many seconds it will take to strike the Russian in the forehead. As recently as 2013, leading scholars purchased copies of these textbooks throughout Afghanistan and Pakistan. In 2011, distinguished political scientist, Professor Dana Bird, purchased a copy of a first grade Pashto language textbook, which taught that T was for topak, or gun. Quote, my uncle has a gun. He does jihad with the gun. M, the textbook taught, was for mujahid, or a person who does jihad. Afghan Muslims are mujahideen, it teaches. I do jihad together with them. Doing jihad against infidels is our duty. As Professor Dana Bird noted, the only differences in the 2011 copies of the textbooks that she purchased and the originals from the 1980s were that the images on the cover showed allegiance to the Taliban and references to the Soviets had been replaced with references to the Americans. In fact, when the Taliban were created and came to power in 1996, they ruled that these textbooks would be used as their official curriculum. So forums asking whether peace is possible in the Middle East can aptly use things like the atrocities of the Taliban, the atrocities of Bashar al-Assad in the Syrian civil war, Saddam's gassing of his own people, as evidence for the importance of these forums. Yet they almost never reconcile the extent to which the United States has been tied up with creating and sustaining the very things it later tries to expunge. That, as history shows us, is almost always the problem of any empire. Events at countless universities and think tanks, just like this one, have a pernicious history behind them. They reflect a very long history of how the idea of the Middle East in the American imagination has been crafted to attain an ontological disposition divorced from America's own history. A disposition rooted in violence and fabricated narratives that largely elides American violence against others as Rumsfeld's statement and the recent statement of President Joe Biden reflect. Violence, so this historical narrative goes, and so Donald Rumsfeld and Joe Biden might readily agree, only counts as violence when it's their violence, not American violence. Rumsfeld's statement that the United States does not count the deaths of others reflects the core of empire, definition by elision. The ability of the United States to debate whether peace is possible in the Middle East on terms that do not account for its own role 
Since 2001, in the deaths of more than one million civilians and the displacement of millions more, reflects a particular kind of American empire. The power to define whose life matters, to radically alter the lives of others, and to disrupt the entire historical arcs of human communities by means of absolving itself of its own history. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Roberts. So our discussant up next to potentially synthesize some of the information or stimulate further conversation is Dr. Mokhtari. He served as a professor of political science at the National Defense University's Near East South Asia Center for Strategic Studies in Washington, DC, and at Norwich University for, three de for nearly three decades. His fields of expertise and interests include comparative government and politics, international relations and diplomacy, political economy, and political philosophy. Well, thank you very much. It is back. Uh, it's nice to be back uh, on campus. I was on this campus teaching for about 20 years. My office was in Ainsworth, uh, next building here for 20 years. Well, let me start with uh, three announcements, uh, very brief. Today is the first day of spring, and uh, at exactly 5.23 and 28 seconds, spring starts. That also is the moment that, you, that the Iranian New Year begins. So, Happy New Year to you. The second announcement is that it is an Iranian tradition for a speaker to apologize to his audience for addressing a group more knowledgeable than he. So on that note, I apologize to you. And finally, I have been asked to discuss three papers in 10 minutes. Each one of those papers has taken at least several weeks to prepare. Uh, to devote three minutes to each is neither just nor proper. So I apologize to you guys for, for that. Now, to discuss any issue of international relations, there are really two ways to do it. One is the time slice method. You take a slice of time, a period, and you study it. The second version of studying international relations, or second method, is a chain link manner of studying, which means you look at what you're interested in and you try to see what has led to or influenced that event. In my personal view, the second one is more likely to give you an accurate conclusion. And the reason for it is very simple. Humans have a tendency to use their historical experiences to interpret things. We create a lens through which we see things, we interpret things, and historical events affect that. A country that has been mistreated by a neighbor, uh, even 10 years or 100 years later, uh, would have reservations dealing with that neighbor. Uh, therefore, that chain link manner of speaking uh, is, is really uh, a more, gives you a better understanding of, of what it is you're trying to study. Now, ignoring historical experiences really could be very costly. And of course, when I say that, I also mean uh, acknowledging what each nation has done in the past. Sanitizing the history uh, really creates misunderstandings and mistrust. Uh, therefore, it is to advantage of all concerned to, to really study history and present history and acknowledge it as it really is. Now, turning to the individual papers, again, I have to be very brief uh, and deal with generalities. Uh, the first paper, uh, China's Economic Rivalry, 
Professor Sviriak's, uh, is a timely analysis, and it is well done, and it is strong on elegant theory. My personal concern is that implementation is seldom as elegant as, as theory. Uh, things get sort of messy when you implement uh, policies, uh, theories, etc. For instance, uh, the economic theory that war is a continuation of economic rivalry does not really explain economic policies with the aim uh, and intention of controlling another country's uh, politics or political decisions. The Chinese uh, Belt and Road Initiative, which has been mentioned, uh, illustrates that. Uh, one wonders if the Chinese initiative really is a political policy for political reasons, uh, or it is for uh, something other than economics. Uh, so that, that, that is a concern I have uh, about uh, economic theory. Um, I also, uh, everybody is talking about China, is concerned about China, uh, but I also think that China might have its own perestroika mo moment before very long. Uh, you remember how the Soviet Union fell apart. When I was a student, um, the Soviet Union was increasing its, its uh, GDP and so on at the rate of 6%, the United States 3%. And people were projecting that, oh, this is awful. You know, before long, they are going to surpass us. Well, uh, that didn't happen, obviously. Uh, when I was in Washington, I was talking to a, an old hand, an old China hand, who had spent years in China and studied China, uh, spoke Chinese, uh, several dialects of Chinese. Uh, and I told him, well, what do you think? He just returned, and what do you think? He said, well, China today resembles an elephant riding a bicycle down uh, uh, in a uh, uh, downward and juggling things. And as it picks up speed, it has to juggle more things. It's, it's handed more things to juggle. Uh, so that is, that is the image of China that he had. And I think it is actually uh, not far from uh, being true. So uh, we should take things with a grain of salt when we uh, when we look at China uh, and, and project things a uh, year ahead. The second paper uh, by uh, uh, Professor Moss, uh, again, I commend him uh, for, for the systematic study of, of Russian naval supply capabilities uh, to Syria and, uh, and also the problems of logistics. I would draw attention, uh, however, to the uh, uh, general mood um, of, of Russia and Russians. Uh, in 1976, I was invited to go to, uh, to the Soviet Union. Remember, though, that was the height of the Soviet Union. Brezhnev was, was, was the fellow uh, in charge. Uh, I went there and, uh, as a journalist. Uh, I was there and I saw the infrastructure of the country outside of Moscow was really in bad shape. They had had a bumper crop that year and they didn't have storage for them. So uh, dump trucks would come and dump the grain uh, on the highway. And by the way, when I say highway, it's two-lane highway, not, not four-lane or six-lane or that sort of thing. Uh, and, and therefore, if you wanted to go from one place to another place, you had to go zigzag uh, on the highway to avoid these, these uh, uh, piles of, of grain. Uh, there were other problems, and I would talk to them. I would say, well, you know, for, for such a great country, I mean, these problems are, are you know. Uh, and the response was, but we are a superpower. That image of being a superpower somehow compensated for everything else that was wrong. Now, imagine the disintegration of Soviet Union. Imagine what that has done to their psychology. They were very proud of being a superpower. 
all of a sudden that has melted away. And there is a psychological problem that I don't think we appreciate. Um, now, um, Mr. President Putin uh, is reacting to that. Uh, that, that great loss of prestige, that great loss of all, all the thing that, uh, things that made them proud of themselves. Uh, without that, he's looking for opportunities to reassert, to regain that, that prestige. Uh, now, he has been successful in a number of uh, uh, measures he has taken, uh, but he has uh, blundered into uh, the most recent attempt of show, and, uh, show of force in, in Ukraine. But nevertheless, uh, we should pay attention to that psychological problem that they are dealing with. Uh, the Russian foray into, into Syria and the Syrian conflict was a response to an opportunity. And the opportunity was, on the one hand, the uh, Arab Spring, and on the other hand, the assumption that uh, the Assad regime would fall by just a little push, it would fall apart. That was a wrong assumption. And uh, that gave the, uh, the, uh, uh, the Russians uh, to, in fact, uh, get involved. Uh, there was an opening for them uh, to assert the prestige uh, and, and the power. It is, it is really very hard for them to, uh, to come to grips with, with not being a superpower uh, anymore. Now, the paper uh, clearly points out that the Russian naval lift uh, capability is limited. Uh, and it really cannot do very much beyond the uh, Russian territory. Um, but Russia's weakness, again, I emphasize, that very weakness of Russia uh, is the reason that they are looking for opportunity, any opportunity they can seize to, uh, to deal with that psychological hurt that they feel. Uh, the uh, third paper uh, by Professor Roberts, uh, on question of peace in the Middle East, uh, I must say it's a thoughtful and uh, thought-provoking analysis. It brings to mind the very classic uh, contrasting views of colonizers and, uh, and, uh, uh, and colonies. Now, the very term that we use very often without really thinking about it, Middle East, that illustrates this point. A middle, middle East compared to what? Uh, you know, after all, we, we live on, on Earth is, 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 is round. Uh, if there is an East, there must be a West, there must be a center. Where is the center? Uh, you know, think about that. The center is London. Uh, and that implies something that, that just should not uh, be uh, dismissed uh, easily. Uh, the imagining of, uh, of the Middle Eastern as, as a backward, violent, unruly um, group of people uh, who threaten the United States' interests. Uh, and they have to, frankly, they have to be whipped into shape uh, and forced into stability. Uh, is, is one of those misperceptions uh, that uh, has that colonial tint to it. That, of course, ignores the reality that it was the West that cut and pasted the map of the Middle East and chopped up its historical, sociopolitical communities. Uh, and, of course, now we have to deal with that. I give you an example. Uh, much of the crises in the Middle East in the past 40 years or so could be traced to the Iranian Revolution. Very few people have paid attention to a crucial decision made at Doha. Uh, this is in uh, 
uh, the, the OPEC conference in Doha in 1976, at which the Saudis were persuaded through the efforts of uh, two gentlemen, Mr. Rumsfeld, Donald Rumsfeld, and um, William Simon of the United States uh, to pump up uh, more oil than there was a need for it uh, to reduce the price of oil. And that resulted in basically forcing the Iranian government into bankruptcy. Now, the intention was to clip the wings of the Shah of Iran because he was being too powerful. Uh, the result was a revolution that didn't help the United States, didn't help the oil prices, didn't help anyone. I was attending a Track 2 conference some years ago in Jordan. Uh, this was about two, two decades ago. Um, one of the people who was with me, uh, actually was my boss, uh, was Ambassador Roger Harrison. Ambassador Harrison, in fact, had been ambassador to, uh, to Jordan for a number of years. Now, during one of the sessions of, of this Track 2 conference, uh, there was a country, the representative of a country who talked about history and so on. During the break, we came out, and uh, Ambassador Harrison, uh, in jest, you know, took me to the side, and he said, and I quote here, the, nation, uh, the nations who insist on carrying the heavy burden of history on their backs paralyze themselves. One of the secrets of US success is our short memory. We forget and move on. Now, he said this in jest, but it so happens that almost in every one of these statements, there's a grain of truth. And the grain of truth here is, in fact, that some countries rely and depend and attach themselves to their history so much that changing becomes almost impossible because they lose their identity if they do that. But we should take into account that some of these nations seem obsessed with their histories because that is all they have left. Now, such attachments may be a source of pride, aspiration, and identity, but it also colors that vision, uh, that lens, that filter through which they interpret things. And therefore, knowing their history and their background and what we have done in dealing with them really is important to prevent misunder misunderstandings, mistrust, and misperceptions. Thank you. <laughs> 10 minutes. Thank you, Dr. Mukhtari. Um, now we have a few minutes for questions from the audience. If you have a question you'd like to ask to any of the presenters, please come down to one of the mics in the front. First come, first serve. OK. So what do you guys think about um, Turkey's main involvement in like Syria and other areas? And um, more specifically, um, during the period when Trump removed um, forces from Roj Rojava in Syria? Is the uh, Turkish intervened after the Syrians, uh, sorry, after the Russians intervened in, in Syria. And they still control a large part of the north because of their, uh, ostensibly because of their Turkish problem that they have with the various groups and being concerned, at least that's the reason they put forward, uh, that, that the attacks that originate uh, from Kurdish groups. So um, they haven't left, though. And there's uh, questions. I, I know uh, Assad was, there was talk of Assad meeting with Erdogan. Um, but... Assad apparently refused as long as there were Turkish troops on Syrian territory. So impasse for the foreseeable future until something changes. Um, in 
in terms of controlling the Turkish Straits, I think that the Turks are being an honest um, uh, custodian of the Montreux Convention of 1936, which is what regulates it. They made the correct call, a state of war does exist within the Black Sea, regardless of what the Russians are calling it, the special military operation. It's just another name for a war. So they rightly closed down the, the Turkish Straits, uh, but not just to Russian and Ukrainian military traffic, but to all military traffic. So as to try to, I, I don't know, uh, put a, a tamp the, the, the level of violence right, and try to prevent it from expanding. So um, good on the Turks in, in that one. Would it restrict uh, Romanian, um, like Romanian commercial trafficking there due to the uh, closing? The Romanians, because they're a riparian state, um, they, the, their navy is not particularly large, so they, they really just focus on the Black Sea. They don't have the interests outside of that, okay. per se. And same with Bulgaria. Um, the Russians are the, the, the dominant force, if you want to call it, the naval force in the, in the Black Sea, although after their cruiser was sunk in April of last year, um, they have basically been sidelined for the most part. They're conducting precision strike against targets in Ukraine using the, something called the caliber cruise missile. But other than that, um, the, the Turks actually have the, the next largest naval force, but it's divided between the Black Sea and then the uh, Aegean. Okay, thank you. Over to my left. Hello, my name is Maddie. I'm a sophomore at Dartmouth College. My question is mostly for Dr. Roberts. Um, and so in your presentation, which was really fantastic and enlightening, uh, you talked a lot about the, how the U.S. has a very selective view of its past. Um, Dr. Mukhtar, you also mentioned this in saying that the U.S. has a short-term memory, which is true. Um, and so something I came across in my own research is in past years, um, several Middle Eastern leaders have referred to the U.S.'s own violent history when trying to absolve themselves of their own crimes. Um, and so I'm interested to know in your research and your opinion, Dr. Roberts, um, what you would say about how our recognition or our lack thereof of our own violent history in the United States from Native American removal to slavery um, and the legacy of that, how that plays into current international affairs. Um, and just a little anecdote at Dartmouth, we had a speaker a few weeks ago um, that came and said that essentially talking about slavery or um, teaching children about the 1619 project, how that was kind of making us disunified in international affairs. So, I'm curious to know how you would respond to that and what your take on how our domestic history plays into our international presence. Sorry, that's long-winded. Thank you, though. Uh, thank you, Maddie, for the great question, and thank you to both Dartmouth students for being here. Um, I, thank you for asking that because it allows me the space to m make a point that I want to make, and uh, I'm gonna make that point by coming at you guys way out from left field right now, which is I love Notre Dame football. I criticize the hell out of their coaching staff and all of their players. I don't criticize Oklahoma football, Michigan football, Texas football, because I don't love Oklahoma or Texas or Michigan football. I love Notre Dame football. So I'm cognizant of the fact that we are at a military school. There are active duty military officers in the room, and I just criticize the US military. On the one hand, that's what makes us American. On the other hand, it raises a, a bigger point, I think, about humans and, and what we do with knowledge, which is we criticize that which we love. It's the only way to make something better. So that's kind of a long way, a long-winded way of saying, I think it's tremendously unfortunate how politicized scholarship uh, is in the country right now. You know, like, slavery is terrible. This country was, you know, the last of the, of the uh, Western, you know, democratic countries to abolish slavery and so on and so forth. It's mind boggling to think how could that ever become something controversial to talk about in a scholarly setting, you know, that this country was a slave holding country. Um, I do think though that the, you know, the thing about history is you really can't control it. The sources are out there and people think for themselves. Um, I mean, this is entirely my opinion, but if I were to advise any of the politicians running on these things, uh, I would say, you know, you're, you're never gonna beat knowledge. Uh, and so, yeah, I th and the only way anything is ever improved is by talking about it and debating it. Uh, so I think the more discussions we have, whether we agree with them or not, the better. As a, another historian, uh, history is full of contradictions. 
the same the same people who wrote about freedom and liberty and, and our defining documents of the United States, ha close to half of them were slave holders. How do you reconcile those? It's the contradictions that make history interesting, but it's also an understanding of that that allows you, as Nick was saying, to kind of figure out ways forward. So, so as, as Professor Moss just said, you know, one of the unfortunate things too is, and I wanted to begin actually my remarks, I didn't because of time, with an apology to the students in the room and that every single one of you, without exception, has come of age in a time of this unprecedented polarity and superficial thinking where you are inundated with either X or Y. And almost nothing in history is either X or Y. I have a student who was a combat medic in both Iraq and Afghanistan. He saved the lives of countless Iraqis and, and Afghanis. He was in Syria as well. That's true. It's also true that, that the United States military did things that led to the deaths of civilians. So nothing is ever X or Y. Good afternoon. Thank you for your wonderful presentation, by the way. Um, this question is for, for all the presenters. <laughs> um, for uh, Professor Moss, uh, I found your work to be especially interesting given the naval focus, which I have a personal interest in. Regarding the uh, Russian string of pearls, as it were, um, and its relation to utilizing Syria as a means to reclaim uh, lost logistical avenues, uh, economic enfranchisement, and of course, a callback to perhaps a grandiose image of what Russia may have been, how now is the conflict in Ukraine affecting this Russian string of pearls? And will this concept perhaps be diminished by the fact of Russia's own internal destabilization economically, socially, however you frame it, as well as in Syria for their benefactor, as, as, as their benefactee, actually. Entirely. Um, that is a, a shift because of that perceived success in, in Syria. Um, I think that perceived success in Syria also led them to have overconfidence in Ukraine. You, you see these, uh, these successes often lead to bad thinking down the line because you've learned the wrong lesson. So the Russian ability to, to actually have more than a, a string of pearl <laughs> so the one artist, but to actually expand it is, is highly questionable, especially with the Turkish Straits closed. Um, but again, they came out there with their Vladimir Putin has come out and said that the uh, demise of the Soviet Union was the greatest geopolitical catastrophe of the 20th century. That's a very loaded statement considering the 20th century also got cut in World War II, and 26 million Soviet citizens died. And it's, uh, it's about perspective, and it's, it's again about prestige. So they might desire to kind of re regain that glory, the practical limitations on it, and then just the resources that they have. Um, Highly, highly questionable. Um, one of the uh, one of the military bloggers I follow, a Russian guy named Alexander Shishkin, wrote that the defense budget is not made of rubber. So it's not just going to like bounce back, and that the, the money is going to have to come from somewhere. And ships are very expensive to build, so um, Russia is going to have to kind of reorient its priorities uh, for, for these types of projects. Thank you. To my left. Hi, my name is uh, Brian Connolly. I'm a student in the uh, Strategic Studies and Analysis program here. Um, what got me into this program um, was my 18-year-old self asking me why I'm standing in Marja, Afghanistan as a Marine fighting um, the very first battle there in a city that we built um, back in the 60s. And I've been confused as to the spiral of events um, what strategic studies even is. You, you mentioned Soviet invasion, and I'm wondering, um, decades predating that, Afghanistan had a very bright future ahead of it. We went there um, 
as I'm sure you know, to build a dam to start their agroeconomy, build a few cities for them. And what we thought was a benevolent civil augmentation for them um, that very quickly spiraled after coup after coup into insurgency into the Taliban, Soviet invasion, et cetera. How do we think of the world as, a, as mil, young, lead, young leaders when it seems sometimes two truths are true at once, where often people think of us as trying to establish an empire and revolting violently when we think that we're helping, and then we end up fighting there and dying again. We seem to ripple over and over, and it's, it's been confusing myself and my Marines for years. Is there any kind of quick answer to that? Um, thank you for the question. Um, my answer would be uh, to ask you to turn your question into a statement and hear what you think, which we could do afterwards. But one thing I, I'll say is, uh, you know, I just said you can't control knowledge. I mean, one of the things I think we, we have seen come about from the 20 years of war is uh, a tremendous amount of whatever you want to call it, trauma, pressure, second guessing of our own service members. You know, um, being told that you're going to liberate a country and bring freedom to a country and then saying, no, 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 it's shock and awe, uh, raises fundamental questions. And, and our service members think for themselves and they've written about it since then and created movies. And you know, that paradox of mission um, was very apparent, I'd say, to the people who were there. Um, and they began to question, uh, Professor, Professor Mukhtari talked about the borders. Um, one of my very best friends uh, was, uh, was in Iraq, and he was accompanying a patrol that was out, and of course they saw a, it was a, a you know, no-go zone, no one was supposed to be there, and they saw a shepherd, a man, an old man with his sheep, they stopped him, they had a translator, they said, hey, don't you know, no one, we have to arrest you. No one is supposed to be here right now. Uh, you're too close to the border. It was with the border with Iran. The shepherd responded through the translator, why did you guys put the border between me and my sheep? So these sorts of, you know, what the heck am I doing here, um, were evident to the service members. That's why I said in my pre presentation, this is not a scholarly abstract. I'm not making this stuff up. Um, but I'd love to talk with you more after. Sorry for my non-answer. <laughs> One more succinct question. Uh, my question is primarily for Dr. Roberts, but if anyone would like to also add to it. Um, you mentioned the importance of recognizing the role that America has played, acknowledging both the good and the evil um, in Middle Eastern affairs. And as it was mentioned before in panels, um, there is a need for accountability because the United States cannot erase what it did, what its role in the Middle East. Um, but everything is very theoretical and how do we give practical advice to those making those decisions um, in how to actually turn this accountability into actions and not merely saying, yes, we are responsible? Yeah, the short answer is just read books. Uh, Professor Michael Thunberg and I were just in D.C. We take students to D.C. every year, uh, or he does. I, I just go along to help. And uh, all the government people we were talking to, they said, hey, you know, no, we don't have time to read long things. You guys got to learn how to, you know, take your stuff and put it into one paragraph. Well, hey, I'm the taxpayer. I want you to read long things, uh, you know, because when you don't, we do things like invade Iraq. Uh, so read books or Afghanistan, so read books. That's my answer. Thank you for the questions. That concludes this session. Can we get another round of applause for our presenters?